live. Excellent. Well, on that note, um, welcome. Oh, we've been live for a while, have we? Oh, dear. It, it, it only just told me this second it went live. Anyway, that's part of the joy of this Zoom, isn't it? It's so unprofessional um, that that you can know that we're real people and it's not it's not faked um well um welcome everyone if you're watching on the live stream and everyone who's joined us in the room um lovely to see you all um we have very special in our group actually we are very blessed with some many um experienced teachers and experienced professionals that can um that can really bless us as a group and i was so thankful that mr long um accepted my invitation to come and speak tonight he um, has done the diploma exam more times than you can count and passed with good marks <laughs> not and failed 10 times and then passed once no he's and he's even done the frsm so um he's very experienced and he's an experienced teacher also teaching um in particular diplomas and viva voces um so um with no further ado if we could welcome mr lung thank you thank you sarah so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So my name is Wai Kit Lung. I'm a teacher from Hong Kong. And as you can see, I've taken quite a few ABRSM uh, performance diplomas. So today I would like to share my experience with you and some keys to success with these exams. So uh, for ABRSM diplomas, if we are not counting the new ARSM, there are three levels. So the first level is the deep ABRSM, which is the diploma of the Associated Board of the World Schools of Music. The second level is the LRSM, Licentiate. And the third level is FRSM, the Fellowship. So to take these exams, you have to do it one step at a time. So uh, after grade eight, you can take the deep ABRSM. And if you pass the deep ABRSM, you can proceed to the LRSM, and after that you can do the FRSM. And you cannot jump level unless you have a qualification from another board or from a music school that can serve as a substitute. So in terms of higher education equivalence, deep ABRSM is like a certificate of higher education in level or uh, first year of music college. LISM is a, like a bachelor's degree and it's like uh, what someone should play like at the end of a three year music college. And FISM is like the master's degree level. So for ABRSM diplomas, Candidates are expected to compile a balanced recital program using editions of music that suits your interpretation and write about the music. Candidates are also expected to talk with confidence about the music. They have to sight read a short piece to a reasonable standard, and this part is called a quick study and they have to put on the best possible performance on the day. For ABRSM performance diplomas, there are three components. The first component is the recital, which is the actual performance of the pieces. And that's 60% of the overall mark. The second component is the FIFA Voce, which takes 25% of the overall mark. And the FIFA voucher is what we are going to talk about mostly today. And lastly, the quick study is 15% of the overall mark. So you might think, well, the recital is 60% of the overall mark, so maybe if I ace it, then, then I'll do well for the exam. But actually, that's not the case, because to pass, you have to pass each and every section. And the pass mark for each and every section is 40%. So it's not possible to pass with an overall mark of less than 40. You either get 40% on each uh, component and barely pass, or you get more than that. 
And in case you are not successful in any of the components, you can retake only that component for the retake and not have to do the entire exam over again. So the fever fortune for the uh, APISM performance diploma actually consists of two components. So the first one is program notes for deep APISM and LSM, or a substantial written submission for the FISM. And that's to be prepared before the exam. Uh, before COVID, you bring the program notes with you to the exam. But uh, before, because of COVID uh, because, uh, and, and uh, concern with hygiene, I think now you have to submit your program notes at the exam entry so that the examiner will uh, don't have to take a piece of paper that is not sanitized or whatever. And the second component for the FIFA voce is the real FIFA voce, which is like an oral exam. So in that portion, you have to discuss with examiners whatever questions they ask you, which is most likely related to your recital program. So for the program notes for deep APSM, you have to write about 1,100 words plus or minus 10%. That means you can do a maximum of 1,210 words and a minimum of 990 words. And you should write your program notes for a general concert audience. For the LRSM, the word count is quite a bit more. It's 1,800 words plus or minus 10%. And you should discuss the missile content in more detail and with more technical language. So how do you prepare for writing the program notes? Actually, the preparation should start from day one. You should only pick pieces that you can write about. Normally, we pick pieces for an exam that we can play well or we can play um, to our technical level. But if you pick pieces that you can play well but not write anything about, that will be a problem when you have to write your program notes. So just an example. Uh, one time I picked a piece for one of my students for his deep ABRSM. It was a very fun piece, esoteric, not mainstream. But then when we tried to get information on that piece, we couldn't find anything on the internet. The composer is kind of obscure and no one has ever written about the piece. So what do you do in that case, right? And you cannot skip one piece in your program notes. You have to write about all the pieces you are playing. So before you pick the pieces, you have to know whether you can write about them. That's very important. And if you cannot write about a certain piece, then don't pick it for your exam. Maybe do it uh, for something else, but don't do it for your diploma. So uh, in the previous slide, I show you the word count for the uh, program notes. Actually, the word count is independent of the number of pieces you play. So from my personal experience, I found it not so difficult to write 250 words or 300 words for each piece. If I have to write 400 words, it, it gets a little bit harder. And 600 words for each piece is quite, uh, quite difficult. So you may want to play more pieces, shorter pieces, rather than a few long pieces. When you play multiple short pieces and you write the program notes, you talk about the composer, talk about the background of the pieces. That, that's already like 150 words, 200 words easy. So you don't have to go very deep into the analysis of the pieces. And for, let me go back. So for example, for LISM, you have to write 1,800 words. If you only play two pieces, 
you have to write my hand job to the piece and that's tough uh, at least for me I it, it was difficult for me to write that many words for for one piece right but on the other hand if you play five pieces for your LSM each piece you only have to write 360 words and that's not that difficult so you may want to have that in mind when you program for your exam so what do you have to write for your program notes your program notes should have a balance of background information and analysis and personally I think for a general audience maybe background information or gossip would be more interesting than very deep analysis so normally I go one third one third one third this way one third of my work time would be on the composer's background one third of my work time would be on uh, the pieces background or, or uh, for example if you talk about Mozart's piano sonata in A minor you may want to talk about Mozart's piano sonatas in general and then zoom into that particular sonata talk about the background uh, how it was conceived for whom it was composed when was the first performance that kind of stuff and then go into the technical analysis of the form and design of the piece so go from very broad to less broad to very focused and that has served me well for my exams and for my students exam and there ought to be some areas that one is more capable of writing about and one is less capable of writing about and my advice is focus on your forte and don't write so much on things that you are not happy to talk about so it may sound obvious but I just have to remind you don't include contents that you don't understand or something that you are not able to discuss further one time uh, someone who just failed her LSM came to me uh, with the mark, uh, mark form and uh, the program notes so she got 5 out of 25 on her FIFA voucher which was really an overkill she didn't just fail the examiner wanted to make a point that she fell really really bad and I look at her program notes at first class it looked quite professional right? uh, very complicated and then I saw that uh, the contents actually had no relationship with, uh, uh, between the paragraphs so obviously she didn't know what she was writing about to put it politely and to put it bluntly she didn't write her program notes she just copied from different sources and examiners always ask you about what you write and if you cannot back it up or cannot explain then that's uh, pretty much uh, an automatic fail because that uh, smells of plagiarism and and it's not allowed and the second point is uh, very interesting I strongly recommend non-native speakers of English to write their program notes in their own languages and have the program notes translated so let me tell you why so even if you can one can write in English if your writing is not that fluent it would impact your overall mark and I don't think it's really appropriate to have someone to touch up on your program notes it's a great area and I don't want to get into that but if you write in your own language and have a professional translator translate your program notes into English the writing will be good right you just have to supply your contents and if you get a good writer the writing will be good and it's totally legit uh, you can just submit the original version and the translator version with uh, a third party 
uh, signing the translation, saying that this is a true translation of the of the original program notes. And I have done that with my students multiple times, and all of them passed with very high marks. Uh, no, no problem whatsoever. So this is something that uh, you may consider when you submit your program notes. Uh, so I think there's some background noise. Is it from me, or maybe someone is not muted? Could you uh, check for me? Everyone is muted. Yeah, everyone is muted. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Maybe my mic is uh, rubbing on your my shirt. It's not. It's okay. not too much that it's bothering us. Okay, 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 okay. So uh, after you have written your program notes, proof me. I cannot emphasize this enough. For my LISM, actually, I have one typo. I think I type uh, except instead of except. I type an extra R. And I've proofread it like uh, 12, 20 times or 30 times and never saw it because I wrote it and it looked normal to me. And the exam no, no, really took exception. He was very angry about it. At the exam, he, he told me in my face, well, you, you, miss, uh, you have uh, a spa, uh, gram, gram, grammatical mistake here. This is really bad. And he wrote that in the exam report also. And I had an even more embarrassing moment for writing. I was translating for my student, and I was trying to write topic performance. And for some reason, I, I missed the L in public. Luckily, uh, my student caught it before she submitted the, the, the program box. Otherwise, I don't think it will go down very well with the examiner. So, Proof read and better still get a different person to proof read for you because many times you cannot find your own mistakes. When I when I see other people's writing, I can I can see the mistake right away. But when I when I look at my own writing, I can I can look like 10, 20 times and I can never find some tiny stuff. So get someone else to proof read for you before you submit the uh, program notes because. This is supposed to be a professional level exam. You, uh, for for example, LSM, you are supposed to be a music graduate, right? And the recital is public performance standard. And I don't think audiences, uh, audience members, will be very happy if they see uh, typos or uh, grammatical mistakes on the program notes in the public performance. So do try to make it as professional as possible. And no plagiarism allowed. This is very important. I have another funny story. Uh, I think about 10 years ago, someone came to me, asked me to look over her FISM written submission. So she was playing the uh, Busoni transcription of the Bach Chacon for uh, solo violin. But she didn't write on that. On her written submission, she was writing on Rachmaninoff's transcription of the uh, E major partita by Bach. So I asked her, why, why, why are you writing something else? And, and she just mumbled, right? And I looked at her writing. It, it looked like uh, very informative, but the language was kind of funny. And then I looked online. I did a quick search. I found a dissertation on the Rachmaninoff transcription of the Bach partita. And she was just substituting certain words with her own words. So change maybe pick to choose, pick to uh, gigantic, something like that. And, and, and it's easy to, to be found out. It's easy. Right? So don't do that. It's, it's a crime. And it will, uh, wouldn't go down well. So as I said, if you don't know what to write about a certain piece, don't play that piece. Play something else. Maybe you have to pick a piece that you really know how to write but not play so well, so that you can pass both sections. It is, it's, uh, it's totally possible. So now we go to the Viva Voce area. So what are examiners going to ask you about in the Viva Voce? 
uh, very common. You have uh, you are asked about the composers that you are uh, playing for the recital, and then they are contemporaries. So, what do we mean by that? If you play a Mozart piano sonata, you are expected to know a little bit about Mozart. What else he wrote? Maybe how many piano sonatas he wrote? And also, what other piano sonatas other people wrote in that period? Because you have to compare his work to his contemporaries. So, if you play a Mozart piano sonatas, sonata, you better know that Haydn also wrote piano sonatas, and also there were Clementi, uh, Dushek, that kind of thing. And examiners may want to ask you about the forms and structures of the pieces. So if the piece is in binary form or in sonata form, you should know about it. And the examiner often will point to different sections of the piece and ask you, oh, uh, what section is this? Is it a, a, a development section or whatever? Or even ask you some uh, motivations that's going on. So make sure that you know the forms and structure of the pieces that you play. And you are expected to know the history and development of your instrument. If you are a pianist and you play piece by Bach, then you should know that in Bach's day, the modern piano didn't exist. And Bach played on harpsichord, clavichord, and organ. And you should also know the method of tone production of those instruments, at least at a surface level. So examiners often start their discussion from the program notes. And your program notes is the point of departure. So if you want to get uh, asked questions that you can answer comfortably, it's better for you to write more in those areas. For example, you are a history uh, guru. You know everything about uh, the private life of every composer uh, in classical music. Maybe you, you can write more uh, about the composer's background in your program notes. If your program notes is a little bit unbalanced, maybe the examiner will, will say something about it, or maybe they won't be totally happy. But I have not seen anyone who uh, failed because uh, the content is unbalanced. You will pass for sure, at least from my experience. It's better to be a little bit unbalanced and write very well and convincingly than to be balanced and write some gibberish or uh, something that's not uh, correct. So focus on what you know best, write more about it, and lead the uh, examiners to discuss those things with you, rather than going into a uh, blind alley and, and talk about things that you, you cannot discuss. And the next one is quite funny. I think it's a cardinal sin to be unable to discuss what you have written. What does it mean if you cannot discuss what you have written? I think it's pretty obvious that you haven't written what you purport to have written, right? So that smells of plagiarism, and it's very bad. So how does one prepare for the exam? Maybe I can talk about my own experience. I think I prepare for my exam maybe 15 years before I took the exam. Because I listen to classical radio uh, every day. And I always was curious about the life of composers, about the pieces. As I listen to the radio, I always listen to the end and, and try to know what piece it was, 
who uh, who wrote it and and uh, what was the background? If you want to do well in the FIFA World Trade, you cannot just take it as a like a uh, like a school exam and prepare a few weeks before the exam. You have to live in music and and be curious every day and learn as much as possible about classical music. And you have to read a lot. So for me, I had a huge CD collection. I think I lost count of how many CDs I had. I think I have over 10,000 CDs. And I read the Jack and Doctor of each and every one of my CDs and try to learn something about the composer and about the pieces. So uh, when I prepared for my exam, I already knew a lot. It wasn't a uh, very difficult task for me to get ready. And another part of the preparation that most people uh, neglect is listening to a, a lot of music. You should not just focus on the pieces you are playing for your exam. If you play a piece by Bach, for example, a prelude and fugue, then you should also listen to other pieces by Bach and see how how do those prelude and fugue fit into his overall composition output. And if you want to play a piece by Mozart, you should listen to his opera, because many of his instrumental pieces have operatic writing. And without knowing his operatic style, you really cannot perform his pieces properly. And you cannot discuss his pieces properly also with the examiner. So listen to a lot of music. I think it's much easier now than when I was growing up, because now there are legal and not so legal copies on, on YouTube and everywhere else. If you want to listen to music, you just have to click on a button and you, you, you get it. And in my days, I had to go to the library or go to the CD store to get uh, recordings. So there's really no excuse for someone to not know about music these days. And from my experience, LP, checker notes, and CD insert notes are really great sources of information. On some pieces, uh, I couldn't find the information anywhere else, in books, reference books, or dissertation. Only the CD notes contain the information I was looking for. And we have to uh, remember, back in maybe 30 years ago when CD uh, recording companies were still making good profits. They spent a lot of money in the production of the recording, and they hired some top-notch scholars to write the program notes. Really, really high-quality stuff that you cannot find anywhere else. So, uh, well, I don't, I don't work for CD companies, but I always ask people to buy more CDs, buy more recordings. Uh, it's good for you, good for the companies also. And if you prepare for the diploma exams, do get uh, good recordings and, and read the notes, get the information that you need. And uh, grade eight musical music theory is not a prerequisite to uh, diploma exams. But even if you have taken the grade eight theory, it's really not uh, uh, on its own, it's not really enough as a preparation for the diploma exam. Because since 1999 or 2000, they don't ask anything about history anymore or form uh, in the FIFA exam. And for the FIFA voucher in the exam, you are asked much more about forms and design and structure and history than about music theory. I have never been asked to identify a chord in a piece of music, like uh, no examiner ever asked me to uh, point out a German sex or a diminished seventh or ask me what chord it is. But all of them asked me about the history of the pieces and about the composers or about the musical forms of the compositions. So even if you have taken the grade eight music theory, you still have to study about the musical forms and history.
So there's a lot of fake information on the internet. I think uh, when I was preparing for uh, preparing my student for for exam, she came to me with um, some weird information. I said, "Wow, wow, uh, that this doesn't make sense. Where did you find it?" So she found it on the internet. Someone was uh, had a website talking about um, deep uh, exam exam and, and wrote something there. And I was half joking, half serious with my student. I said, well, I mean, the information is really, really poor. It's, it's not correct. Maybe that person didn't pass and just try to uh, make other people fail, too. Uh, I was half joking, but half serious. So don't trust everything on the internet. Personally, I find that the level of publication has gone down a lot since the advent of the internet. In the old days, you have to be somebody to, uh, for, for a major publisher to uh, publish your book, right? But now anyone can write anything on the internet. And not everyone is correct all the time. So if you get information from the internet, you have to be really careful, really, really careful. And again, I, I highly recommend that uh, candidates get the information from CD, Insert notes or from LP checker notes, those are the best source you can find for this kind of information. And for candidates who are not comfortable preparing for the exams on their own, they really should get a teacher who has experience with these exams. Because uh, he, many, there are many wonderful teachers out there who are great at performing or at teaching. I think uh, someone might have unmuted. Oh, okay, it's good now. But uh, not every teacher has experience helping students with writing and with different fortune. So it's really important that you find a teacher who has experience in uh, this area as you prepare for uh, ABRSM performance diplomas. Personally, my diploma students were not my own, uh, my own students. They were students of my colleagues who came to me and asked me to teach their own students on the people voce. And I think if your own teacher is not uh, expert at the people voce, is Maybe it's good to ask your teacher, oh, is it okay to, for me to get a specialist teacher for my people voce? So that you, you get uh, good um, guidance on, on that, in that area. So I want to leave uh, more time for questions. Uh, this is pretty much uh, 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 most of the stuff I want to talk about today, but I think many of you may have questions for me. So, Sarah, is it a good time to take questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions um, from the, the chat and the live stream. So one question um, is, what, what do we do if we've got pieces of music that are in the syllabus, but we can't find any information about them? Yeah, that's a good question. So for APRSM, actually, the this is quite large. For piano, I think, uh, I, I counted once, for LSM there are over 250 pieces. So there ought to be some pieces that you can find information on. So that's my point. If you love a particular piece but you cannot find information on it, maybe don't do it for your ABRSM diploma. Do it for something else, but don't, don't do it for the diploma. Um, I, I, I replied to the comments saying that often, you, if you can get access to a university library that opens so many doors to information that isn't readily available elsewhere, but it's, 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 it's finding someone you know who's got access to that information um, can be helpful. Um, yes, yes. So that is for young students who don't know when you're looking in groves or something like that and you're limited. University libraries are the place to go, particularly music journals. 
um, and you often have to pay to join a university library or find a friend. Um, so <laughs> that was that was question number one. And um, there's a fair few questions in the chat. So one of the questions was about quoting. So um, do you recommend um, paraphrasing? I just, I've lo locked my kids out of the house. One second. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, can I have a question? I have a question. Can I get the things I need from Viva Bose for my books that I bought that I bought from a bookstore? Sure, sure. It is good information. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So can I use Microsoft Word while typing things on Viva Bose? Uh, because uh, any word uh, processing software is good. I, that uh, Microsoft Word is what I use. So if that's what you have, then yeah, for sure. Then what should I do in order to give it to the examiner? My Viva Bowls. Email or or which one? Email or print? You you have to submit printed copy. I think uh, two or three. I have to uh, look it up on the uh, from the syllabus. But oh, you, okay. You at least when I took the exam, it was printed copies that uh, we have, I had to submit. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe we can go back to Sarah on the question. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I no, no, no problem, no problem. And, and hadn't thought about how the kids are going to get back inside. Um, so the one question was about when quoting other people. So um, I know there's cultural differences in what's expected in ASA. ABRSM is an international board, so they accept different cultures. My response from an Australian perspective is we don't quote, we paraphrase, and then it's better to synthesize more than one speaker and more than one writer. But ABRSM specifically said that um, referencing is not required for these particular exams. Um, what, as as um, someone from a Hong Kong perspective, academic perspective, what would you say regarding quoting other people? How much quoting would you allow and how would you incorporate it in your essay? So I'll tell you what I did uh, myself. For my FRSM, uh, the written submission, I put quotes uh, all the way. So if I quote someone, I, I put the sources, I had a reference section with uh, all the sources I had and then I use a uh, quoting to, to show where did I get the information. But for deep, A deep ABISM and LRSM, it's supposed to be a uh, program notes rather than a research paper. So you don't really quote uh, like you do in a research paper. But what I did was a particular uh, phrase was uh, written by a particular person. And in my case, it was written by Peter Holman. He said, uh, these few films in my uh, Fifaldi concerto were, were taken from his operas. So in my program books, I said, Peter Holman uh, asserted that these films were taken from those operas. So I think that's clear enough without making it looking weird because you don't see quoting in a program books that you get from a concert. So I hope that, that answers the question. And generally in program notes particularly, they don't include referencing when you when you go to a concert. If it's the dip teach exam, that's slightly different because it's aimed at a different audience, the essay. But I haven't been to a concert yet where there's been referencing in the program notes. So that probably impacts how we write these. Yes, yes. Uh, Deganta has um, pointed out that in the DIP ABRSM singing exam, he was asked to compare composers from the Baroque period and Romantic period. Deganta, I have to say, I got asked in my recorder, DIP ABRSM, I played a French Baroque, a Dutch Baroque, an Italian Baroque, and a German Baroque, and then a modern. And they said, you know, how is this a varied program? And I said, well, the recorder's history is, is such and such. And the next question he said, was now tell me the difference between French Baroque, German Baroque, Italian Baroque, and Dutch Baroque. And I was really, I was, I know what it is, but I never actually put it side by side. So that's a really good point. Really good point well, to make that it's is worth comparing. Game. There's no limit as to what they can ask you. Some examiners are not as adventurous. Some are very adventurous. I, actually, the hardest ever FIFA watcher I had was for my old advanced certificates. 
I, I think I answered all the questions very well. So the examiner really, really went out of his way to try to test my limits. So he asked me to talk about the family of a, of a particular oboist. So I talk about the grandfather of the oboist, the father, the brother, and then the uh, the examiner wasn't happy. He even uh, talked about on his own uh, the sisters of the oboist. Yeah. So uh, everything is uh, up there, but. Again, if you are not comfortable answering those questions, don't get yourself into that situation. For example, if you don't know the difference between German Baroque and French Baroque, maybe don't program both. Maybe program just one and then play some modern pieces. So you, have, you really have to have the FIFA voucher and program look in mind when you program your exam. Otherwise, uh, you may have to <laughs> redo your FIFA voucher at, at a cost. Mm -hmm. It's worth adding to that that it is actually okay if you don't know. The examiner's not going, oh, failed, they didn't know something. And, and that was my very first DIP ABRSM exam when um, I was asked a, a particular question about why my piece didn't finish on the topic because I stated the piece unusually didn't finish on the tonic. He said, why? And I, my response was, oh, I didn't think of that. And as soon as I said that, I thought, oh, my goodness, I failed because I had, did not know the answer, but I didn't. He asked a whole heap of other questions. He, he knew I didn't know it. He didn't bully me for not knowing it. We were on to the next question. And I did really well in the Viva Watch despite not knowing one answer. So don't ever think, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that answer and spiral and then get worse, you know, make more and more mistakes because you're worried about missing one. It's okay not to know everything. Um, the examiners are very, are, in my experience, have been very helpful when they yes. when I haven't known something, which isn't very often, right? Because I know everything, um, almost <laughs> except for yeah, why my piece. Did... <laughs> they try to help you, right? They try to get you to answer questions that you can answer, rather than going in a blind alley. Mm, exactly. And if you cannot answer every question that they ask, probably is on you, not on them. Probably you you are not prepared. Uh, the next question we have here is um, what what would you say is the key information that should be included in the program notes? Key information, I think uh, some background of the composer, it depends on the composer. For Mozart, I wouldn't write he, he was born in Salzburg or he was a classical period composer. I would skip that. But if your composer is really obscure, then uh, write a little bit about it. And if you know the uh, history of the creation of the piece, like uh, maybe a certain performer inspired the composer to write that piece, then uh, that would be useful information. I don't think there's one thing that you must include, and there's flexibility. If you are like a history guru, you, you talk about more about history. And if you are a, like a physical theory specialist, then maybe you do more analysis. There's, there's some flexibility. I guess it's worth mentioning, maybe you did say it and I missed it because I had an attack of insects at one stage, but um, that part of the questioning is actually to see whether you wrote your own notes. Yes. So um, that's sort of, it's almost you don't need to panic because you did write them and you did research them. Um, now, another question we have is from Casey, you said, um, can I get, maybe I'll reword the question, but his question is, can I get the things I need from my books? And maybe I should ask, what books would you recommend that are useful for preparing for Viva Voce? Uh, I already answered his question, but uh, in terms of what books do I recommend, there's really no limit. For me, when I prepared for my exam, I went to the library and read the biography of the composers that I was uh, preparing for. So I read from, from cover to cover. So that's the kind of preparation I did. And, and also, when I play a concerto, I went to the library and, and read a book about concerto from 1600 to, to the 20th century. So it depends on what you play. You try to go way deeper than you need to, then you will be safe probably. I would suggest the New Groves Dictionary is a really good starting point. And if that's a bit too heavy, there's the Oxford Companion to Music as a starting point that you could get your first basic level of information. And then um, books that have been published by reputable publishers are always excellent, as are um, peer-reviewed music journals. Um, so now, 
Harry's question and um, is, are we to expect a sweat inducing grilling or is it a friendly discussion? Well, I don't know about you, um, Mr. Long, but didn't they tie you up and handcuff you and then ask you the questions? No, I think the hardest one I had was for actually the lowest level exam. I think the, uh, the examiner was just having fun and tried to explore my limits. But otherwise, well, also I, I'm quite knowledgeable. So except for my first exam, for all my ABRSM diplomas, I have never failed to answer any of the questions that was thrown at me. So I was not uh, nervous. Some people are more nervous than some others, but for each person, if that person is better prepared, he or she will be less nervous. So if you are prepared and you know what you are talking about, uh, you'll be less nervous. Mm. Uh, it's, it's worth saying that I, I've never met an exam, an examiner that has been intentionally sweat inducing. Um, definitely they want to know what you know and if they feel like you're getting nervous, yeah. they'll actually try and calm you down. Um, the most nerve wracking exam I had was an examiner who kept interrupting me. And I'd say like, I'd start my sentence and he'd ask the next question. And I did really well in that exam. And in hindsight, and I look back, I go, you know what? He heard the first part of my sentence and he knew, ah, oh, she knows this. So he didn't let me finish my sentence because he was on to the next question, see if I knew that. So um, that to me at the time made me a bit more sweat induced thinking why he never let me finish my sentence but now I realize because he realized that I knew the answer and I'd said enough so don't be put off as well if you're interrupted um, because it just means you've actually said a good enough answer um, I have to say uh, these people voting are much less stressful than a uh, defense of a master's degree or a PhD degree because I've, I've done both and he's not that technical not that difficult so if you are well prepared there's nothing to worry about i have to say uh, and then if you are you you are a not a native speaker of english you can get a translator the, the examiners are very good with non-native speakers too because they're, they're, they're used to it so they're not going to go oh my goodness you used the wrong word or you weren't sure of that word um so yeah that's one thing there was something else i was going to say uh it'll come back to me um, possibly a Victoria, this is Victoria asking, possibly a contentious question. Are the ABRSM diplomas significantly better respected than others? For example, Trinity. Um, I noticed that Trinity only have program notes for the fellowship level. So given that the ABRSM diploma and above are not available in Europe at the moment. Okay. So at the moment, only Trinity is available in some countries. I'm in the same boat for the diploma levels. So um, what Victoria is asking is, are ABRSM significantly more respected than Trinity? Um, it's not something I want to talk in a public forum. I, I know what I think, but, but probably it's not uh, very nice to, to put it this way. But I, I, think I, I think the same way as Victoria, so put it. And I think an answer to that, um, Victoria, at the moment is any licentiate is better than no licentiate. And I've had to say that to my students, you know, yes, we all wanted to do LRSM and just before COVID, we were about to, I mean, as in we, as in them, but, um, and then we couldn't. So I said, okay, we'll record for an LCB. It's not, it's not LRSM. It's not the diploma you wanted to do, but one licentiate is better than none in the, down the track. So that, that's probably the answer, rather than trying to compare. Each board has its own benefits and um, pros and cons, so to speak. But um, a licentiate is better than none. So just at the moment, do what you can to get a licentiate. Or maybe use the extra time to be better prepared for the people project and get a higher mark for, for the exam when it comes. You can do uh, both. Yeah. Get two licentiates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, uh, then uh, uh, once a tombstone would have more letters, right? You can put the letters after the name. So, uh, in my on my tombstone, I can put many letters. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> and that's what Victoria said. Um, doing both. Um, now, um, Harry's asked that um, so he's read that during the VVF voucher, you can use your instrument to demonstrate passages or thematic materials. Qu question. Uh, 
sorry, I, I missed the question. Can, can he so his that? question is, can you use your instrument instrument to help you answer the questions, basically? For my FISM, I did. I, I brought with me a Baroque oval, so I show how the Baroque oval look like and how the fingerings were different. So that's an option, but it's not a requirement. And I've never been asked to demonstrate on my instrument. I've only volunteered, but never been asked. Yeah, I, I was the same. I was once asked that you said you weren't asked about the chords, but maybe because I included aspects of harmonic analysis in my Viva Voce, I was specifically asked to show, oh, you said that he used extended harmony, show me. And when I looked at the score, I thought, oh, I just can't quickly see it. I sat at the piano and played, and went, ah, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so so you, you get what you, you bargain for. If you write about it, you'll be asked. And if you, if you just avoid that area, maybe you won't get asked. <laughs> Because I, I, I'm more of a history person or, or a gossipy person, right? So I'm, I never went very deep in the harmonic analysis. I've never been asked a single question on those. They're not I'm... looking for someone who can answer questions in 100 different areas. If you know certain areas well and other areas reasonably okay, you're good to go. I did this in Spanish exam. Every time they asked me a question, like, what do you like? I started talking about music and all the things about music, the technical music terms, I got very good marks because I was talking clever, but actually I just kept talking about music to keep it down. Now, there was one thing I was going to say, and, I, and then I forgot what I was, my thought made track, and that was with, if, if you can afford it, um, I found with my students for the families who could, it's good to have a practice ABR, a dip ABRSM. And so I tell the, the student, okay, we're going to do it twice. We're going to do it once in May and once in November. And the first time is your practice, so feel free to fail it. Because this is, this is so you can go, oh, now I know what the questions are going to be so that I can pass it in November. Now, this, this it does depend on the child a bit, but I found it was really helpful because the students were like, oh, this is the one I can fail. I'm only practicing the Viva. So if they did fail, they'd know what to do when they repeated it. But they weren't nervous because they were... And so they actually all passed anyway. But that was a, a, a strategy I used because I thought, well, when I do an exam, I've done the DIP ABRSM five times. So if I do it again, it's like I know the questions before you ask it sort of thing. But when it's your first time, it's very nerve wracking because you've never done it before. So there's probably mixed opinions on whether it's okay to put a, ch a student in is saying, oh, this is your aversion to fail. But it did work well for my students. Well, if the finance is not a problem, then when the finance is not a problem, that's right. You know, I, I, an examiner told me that actually she met a candidate who entered a deep ABSM piano performance 16 times in a year, 16 times. So she was getting lots of practice. But I, I, I don't think that's absolutely necessary for most people. Well, I definitely, that was a bonus, you know, when the students said, oh, wow, this was only my practice version. I packed it past three out of four sections or something like that. Um, and or I passed all of them. That's a surprise. So it, it, it worked for me. But no, 16, you, I guess you'd be very good at it by the end. And do you stop once you pass or do you keep going until you've got your distinction? I don't know, because in Hong Kong, we have to enter maybe half a year or nine months in advance so she may be hedging the bet right in advance so actually some examiner saw her multiple times in the same exam session oh uh, uh you again but i don't know i don't know if she passed or not i didn't ask well by, by the third or fourth time you can pull out your cups of tea so that's quite Oh, it's you again. Let's have a cup of tea while we do our Viva Voce. <laughs> I, think, I think she knew the uh, quick study specimens really well. <laughs> well, um, that comes to the end of all questions that have been asked. Um, mm. Once again, I want to thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Long. And so, um, and just remind anyone, if anyone is interested in doing the Viva Voce, um, um, Mr. Long offers lessons on this and there's his email or um, there's Facebook as well um, that you can send messages via. So um, I really want to thank you. This has been very informative and um, hopefully a, a blessing to all those who are preparing for this exam.
Um, so thank you. If we can unmute, I think everyone can unmute. If we can unmute and give a round of applause to Mr. Long. That's why I have So good luck to everyone uh, for the exam. Definitely. And as we close, yes, for those doing their exam this session, sorry, your screen's over there. Um, good luck. Really good luck. I hope this was helpful. And um, be confident. And, you know, if all else fails, waffle. Or maybe that means nothing in out of Australia. Like just just talk and pretend you know what you're talking about. If all else fails, <laughs> at least <laughs> you might you never know what you might end up saying. Well, thank you everyone, and thank you especially Mr. Long for joining us. And everyone, have a good day, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.